me came time for us to, in my opinion, go out there and win it all. Mm. We're not we're not eligible anymore. These are questions for Nisa. We wanted to continue to play. All right, so you're back here with Ron OFC. Uh, if you're new to the channel, uh, it's a channel where we just dive into the life of professionals and uh, people alike in the, in the football space. And uh, today we have a very special guest. I know I say this all the time, but we, have, we do have a very special guest, uh, Mohammed. I know him as Momo, but uh, he's a GM of uh, Maryland Bobcats, which is a NISA organization. And um, basically we're going to go into the, the origins of not only Maryland Bobcats, but basically how he came into this this light of uh, becoming a GM of a professional organization. So, Mo, uh, first and foremost, um, where are you from? Thanks for having me. Um, so, originally, I'm from Senegal, right, which is a country in West Africa. Those are my origins. Um, obviously, you know, grew up playing the sport that we all love and then um, kind of got here in the U.S. around the age of 13 or 14. And then, obviously, played in a couple of clubs here in this area, you know, played in high school, college um and then after that you know just kind of switched my prerogative a little bit and started getting into more of a career as far as what i studied in school and then i got back to the game as far as um you know playing in leagues like upsl and things like that and then i ended up with the bobcats which was a very special journey for me um that we can touch on obviously so so you playing locally basically uh, you playing locally, was there anything that even showed to yourself that you were going to end up becoming a GM or a coach or anything like this? Not necessarily, but I knew I always wanted to be a part of the game, right? Whether it was to play it or, you know, be around it or whatever the case may be. This is a game that, like I say, for most people who aren't really from here, this is a culture, right? It's not just a sport. Like, it's a way of life, you know what I mean? So it's something that, you know, I took pride of and I did not expect to, you know, be in certain positions, obviously, but you know, give all the glory to God, right? Because he does everything. And I believe that everything in life happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why we got here. So playing throughout the, the local clubs here, was there anything that maybe stood out for you in terms of, because I'm assuming that when you were playing locally, your dreams at the time maybe would have been to go pro, right? I mean, that's everyone's dream, if you love this game, is to go pro. But sometimes, you know, certain things happen in people's lives where they have to kind of shift their focus elsewhere whether it's, you know, to help out your family or to do certain things if certain things ain't coming fast enough, right? Because that's something that I don't think we talk about enough because there are times where people have certain dreams, right? But there's a time clock on that dream, you know what I mean? So sometimes you have to figure things out and just make things happen one way or another. Okay. So do you feel like also going into that time clock situation, um, maybe the, I don't want to say developmental aspect, but the way the system here is, in terms of UPSL and all these things, do you think it, it would have helped you or anybody in, the, in that matter to kind of see a pathway to go into a certain place? Or do you feel like for you it was... It's actually very hard, if I'm being honest. And and that is why this is things that obviously we'll touch on furthermore, like organizations like the Maryland Bobcats that I work for now are super important in this area because there's a lot of talent. There's a lot of talent in places that most teams don't look for, you know? And I think that, you know, some of those guys might need a little bit of guidance or a little bit of um, just kind of appreciation, you know, just kind of shed some light on them and just kind of teach them certain things or help them with certain things so that they can reach that next level, right? Some people just need a hand, you know? And I think that um, that's one thing that this organization done pretty well at as far as developing people um, that have been forgotten about, right? Or people that made it to certain places and when it was time for them to get injured or things like that, they were forgotten about and no one's really given them that second chance to kind of, you know, fulfill those dreams that we're talking about. So so how did you get to Maryland Bobcats? What what was the story behind so that? So it's actually a funny story, right? Because um, Maryland Bobcats have been around for quite some time. Obviously, they were a team that played in UPSL. They won it all in national and, and the, um, in the national championship in UPSL. And the owner, his name is uh, Jay. I've actually known him for quite some time, but we never had like a, an actual relationship, right? So we'll see each other in these tournaments, you know, these UPSL games and things like that. And we always spoke to each other, right? And he's always someone that, you know, he's like an older brother in the community because he helps out a lot, which we'll touch on even more. Um, and then, so obviously I was playing UPSL doing things and a couple of years ago, I decided to get into coaching, right? So I, obviously I started with the youth 
And a very good friend of mine, his name is Will. You probably know him, William Joe. Yeah. He was playing for Maryland Bobcats. Will was a very good friend of mine, and he's kind of the reason um, why I ended up here. So Maryland Bobcats was going through a transition, and they switched their coaches, and they appointed Alex, Alex Kyle, who's the head coach now, a very good friend of mine as well. Um, so at the time, Alex was the head coach. He kind of needed help, right, assistance and things like that, and the organization just needed – they kind of revamped a lot of things that they got rid of and just were going through a transition, basically. So Will, being my friend playing for the team, reached out to Alex and said, hey, you know, if you're looking for help in the organization, I know I have a very good friend of mine. Um, you know, I think he can help you a lot with the things that I know that he does. And so Alex was like, yeah, no problem. And then he reached out to me through Will gave my information and Alex reached out. And so Alex and I had a conversation and immediately, like when I first met him, we started to click, right? We had a couple of conversations about, you know, our backgrounds, how we grew up and things like that. And things were pretty organic. Nothing felt felt forced. Right. So fast forward now, I joined the Maryland Bobcats as an assistant coach first. So we go through the first season. Obviously, um, it's, it was tough. It was a learning experience for me. It was my first time coaching at a professional level under NISA. And, um, you know, a lot of trials and tribulations. But throughout that, and then another assistant coach came along. His name is Anthony. He's actually a very good friend of mine as well. Um, so then the three of us kind of spearheaded the whole thing, right? Where we kind of went through an entire season just of learning things and just making things happen on the fly. And through our relationship, we were able to do club history because we won the most games that the club has won before, right? And these are three new guys, three rookies, really. Um, you know, so we walked in, into an organization, got that done. And then um, at the end of the season, throughout the season, as things were going, because I also have a background in finance and a couple other things that I do on my personal life, which is things that I've studied, went to school for and things like that. So I was always like talking to Alex because I didn't know what was going on on the back end about, you know, suggestions. Like, I think this can be done this way, this can be done that way. So Alex then, shout out to him, took the conversation to Jay, who's the owner. Like, hey, you know, this guy's helping us here, but, you know, he has expertise in this, that, and the third. I think we should probably have a conversation with him. So then I had a conversation with Jay. Obviously, he was around through the whole season, supporting us, giving us everything we needed to make that first season possible, right? It was a very tough season for us. Um, so how long ago was the first season? Last year. Last year. Last year was our first year. So this is literally our second year together between myself, Alex, and Anthony. Okay. Um, so then, you know, we met. I met up with Jay. So, you know, we kind of talked a little bit. And after sharing with him some of my experiences and the things that I'll be able to help the club with moving forward, he decided to appoint me as a general manager of the club, right? Which is kind of a big deal because now not only do I help out on the coaching staff, I also have to help out on the commercial side of the club as far as growing the brand, um, you know, dealing with contract negotiations, dealing with fund allocations and all of these things that is necessary for a club to be ran the proper way. So obviously, you know, that's essentially how I got there. But there's so much in between that that kind of happened. But to answer your question, that's how we got there. But is that it? All those what you just said, is that the general job of a GM? That's what's expected? Not necessarily. There is a lot. I mean, some people. So there's two different things to that, in my opinion. Right. Because you have general managers that are office guys. Right. They come in, they handle everything on a commercial side and that's it. But then you have those hybrid people who are soccer guys as well, which is what I consider myself. So it's like. Okay, are you just, you know, sitting there with a suit and tie and just kind of, you know, or are you actually like involved on the day to day basis? Because when I got appointed to that position, I didn't just stick to that. I remained an assistant coach at the same time, meaning I was there in those training sessions every day. Right. I was there on all of the trips where we travel. Well, majority of them, because I had to miss some because of certain, you know, other occupations that I have to deal with with my with my job and everything like that. But I was there basically, like on the hand-to-hand, -hand, everyday basis, trying to see exactly what is needed to drive this ship forward, so. So when you came in, what was it that you saw that you, because you were able to express it to Jay, like, this is what I'm able to do, X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. What was it that you saw coming in after being out around there for some time mm -hmm. that you were like, you know what, this needs to change. That needs to change to be a successful club. What did you see? I mean, it, it was a couple of things, right? Because it, it, it all... It all depends on what is actually happening because it was, a, it was a multitude of things, right? So, for example, I'll just give you a quick example. When you come in, you know, as coaches, obviously, we're the one responsible for recruiting and signing players. So now you're looking at, you know, the contracts. You're looking at, you know, how this person is being paid, how that person is being paid, the age profile of this player, um, injury prone and things like that, right? Because there are times where sometimes you look at certain players are being paid the whole season and don't really play, right? But I feel like um, a better assessment could have been done in certain situation, 
depending on the situation. Or some players who are overperforming and not really have the best deal possible to even get the best out of them, right? So those are a lot of things that we talked about. Um, that's just one one of many examples, obviously. Um, and then when it comes to, obviously, the business side of things, when it comes to traveling, when it comes to, you know, lodging, like hotels, things like that, like deals, partnerships with the club, sponsorships, right? Because if you have a product like this, now that I've been in it and seen what it's like, there's no way that more people don't know about this. Mm, you know? Because you, you know what's interesting as you say that, I, nobody can convince me, man. I really believe that soccer is the biggest sport in this country because everywhere you go, every corner, someone's playing pickups. So there's a league over here. Every weekend you go to the to the fields throughout the year, there's some type of soccer being played. Um, as far as the, the I, I, I always struggle to wonder, as far as the marketing side of it, um, why aren't, how many, if you had to guess, how many people are coming to the NISA games or the Bobcast games? Well, we do have a good amount of fans. Like, for example, our first game of the season, which was highly anticipated, I think we had close to maybe a thousand people there. Wow. Yeah, and then that was that was really one of our biggest nights. But one of the things that didn't help us this season was that the schedule was made where we had five or six midweek games, which is Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. So a lot of the people that will really come to our game have to get up early in the next morning. Right. We have kids that come to the game because we do have a youth academy as well. So a lot of those kids, they love to come to the games because their coaches are the pro players, Right. which we'll touch on even more. But like we have, you know, somewhat of a system going on where um, it has to be favorable to us for us to be able to show our product. Right. But, you know, obviously sometimes it, it's kind of tough, but, but, I don't mean to jump, but that's what you just said. You have a system. Um, I was speaking with someone recently, and I was saying that a lot of players in this in this country, they don't have. For example, you can go to a, uh, you can be 15 years old, and they'll push you to a U19s, but the club only stops at U19s. What's the point? You understand? Right. Um, Bobcats has this thing where they not only have an academy, they have the first team. Your academy doesn't play in MLS next. Nope. Uh, not ECNL. Nope. This is a completely different thing altogether. And you guys not only are having an academy outside of what maybe people might know, but you're able to bring kids into. Because I went to the game the other day. You said there were like some 15 or 16 year olds out there. Mm -hmm. What was that part of your vision for the club to give people an option, or what was it? Absolutely, that's one of the main visions for the club, right? the 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 reason for this club, honestly, in my humble opinion, is to shine light on the things that most people are overlooking. And I'll give you a clear cut example, which is a proven fact, right? This season, we played in Nisa, the first team, right? We went eighteen games unbeaten, right? And we had a tournament within the season called Nisa Independent Cup. So obviously we, we didn't want to play our main guys for that because we had a bigger goal at the end of the season. So we decided between us and obviously Alex, who's the head coach and is also the president of the youth, right? So we sat down and we talked about it and we we're like, hey, let's give some of these kids an opportunity to play in that, in that tournament. So we took about six or seven players from the academy. These are 15, 16 year olds, by the way. Mixed them up with some guys that are on the roster that don't get as many minutes and kind of threw them out there to play the professional tournament against other teams. And they won it all. <laughs> These kids literally won it all. And then, you know, Alex will tell you if he was here the next day or the day after or the week after or whatever, he's receiving calls and from colleges looking at these kids because he also has connections with schools right. that now look at our youth product and seeing the first team is doing this, the youth team is being elevated to kind of follow the same model and these guys are winning as well. So there's obviously something cooking over there. So if a kid now, he says, you know, I want to play soccer at the highest level and he's going through high school and he's next jump. Maybe he didn't even get looks for college um, or maybe he did. But most kids that I know, their whole mindset is I want to play in college, not so much the school work. Right. Would you say that the Bobcats is the place to do it because not necessarily Nisa because once again I don't know of any other clubs in America doing that for anybody taking kids off the street having a whole different system to bring kids into a first into a professional environment to give them a chance would you say that for a kid maybe Nisa would be an option or 
Bob Plus is an option for them to to go. I wouldn't say Nisa would be an option. Nisa's league, obviously, it's a you know it's a professional league. They have different organizations there, but I think the best thing for that kid, right, is to be in the right organization. And I'm not saying this because I'm a part of the Bobcats, right? I'm saying this because this is an organization that has proven that they have taken kids, right? Molded them, developed them, had the pro players who are playing here. Some of them have multitude of experience, right? We can go down the list. We can go down our roster to talk about that. But these are guys that have been there, right? Preparing these kids for the next level. We have an academy from U8 to U19. Oh, wow. And by the time you get there, you have two routes to take. So Alex, being the president of the youth, he has connections with schools, obviously, that are looking into our program. If you want to go to school, we'll send you there. If you don't want to go there and you're good enough to sign your pro contract with the first team, we'll elevate you to that. And then after you get there, the sky's the limit, right? You don't have to stay there. You can yeah. come there and perform and someone is coming to get you. So is that something that's, that's happened consistently since, since you've been here, at least, that clubs from other leagues come looking because I know one thing, whether it be USL or MLS, whatever the case may be, because I know one thing that people worry about when they go to a USL team or a NISA team is, am I going to get the chance to continue or am I going to get lost in the system? But you being the GM, and honestly, do you think that most players usually get lost in the system or is it there's an opportunity? I think so. I think some players get lost in the system for multiple reasons, right? It's not just about them sometimes. Sometimes it's, are they being marketed the right way? Right? Are they being marketed in the right places as well? Right? Because, for example, I mean, we had um, a goalkeeper last year. His name is Alex Sutton. He's a very good. He's a very good keeper. He came in, you know, while it was a very tough season for us. Right? Um, grinded it out throughout the season. Had a good season. At the end of the season, he went on to sign with an MLS Next Pro team in Carolina Core, and I think he's doing pretty well over there. So, again, and then now, like I said, at the end of this season, what we've done as an organization is that. As the season was winding down and we were clear champions because we were beating everyone, um, we decided to offer some contracts to some of these young kids that are put them on the transfer market, basically, right? They're a very promising future. So now, towards the end of the season, we've signed five players, three in the youth academy and two from our partner club, which is Bridgeport Club, which is a club that's a local team in the area, amateur team. Uh, they play in the UPSL, but they have something very special going on over there as well. So. So you even getting connected with UPSO, is that because now you're really bringing in the community. Um, I've been in Maryland for a long time. No club brings in the community like this to where like people have a have a, um, like an option or, or can see the light, let's say, of, OK, there's another option. Because I know guys who they might come to me and say, oh, Randy, can you help me prepare? Because I want my goal is to get to Bobcats next year. People are thinking like that. They're not saying my goal is to get to DC United next year because the fact of the matter is DC United is not looking a lot. They're not looking anywhere. They're only looking specific places and these guys, right? But you guys are giving people hope, right? And for you guys to go to a UPSL team, um, what is it that you guys see in this organization and, and the players there? What do you guys see? So just to kind of backtrack a little bit before I get to that, when it comes to just bringing in the community, right? That is something that's very important to me as an individual and is important to us as a staff for the Maryland Bobcats because that is one thing that I feel like will make or break us or the team that we're trying to do, that we're trying to build, right? We have to be community-based. That's the only way. And for to do that, we obviously have to be in the community. I'm heavily involved in the community with a lot of stuff that's going on here, whether it's UPSL, whether it's local African leagues, local Hispanic leagues, and things like that. Because these are things that we all played in, right? We played in there on weekends, and we played in there on our free time and things like that. And you get to meet people, and you get to see what some of these people need, right? But then we have to help them, you know what I mean? So now to go back to the Bridgeports thing, uh, Bridgeports is a team that I played for, right? I played there. Um, he's ran by a guy, his name is Coach Sam. He's a very good guy. He's a very good friend of mine as well, um, like an older brother to me as well. Um, but the biggest thing there was the culture, right? There's a culture at Bridge Sports that something that resonates with me and the way I grew up and the way I was raised, right? Everything is has to be earned. Like right. nothing is given, right, right. right? So as you've seen, or you probably heard, Bridge Sports practice has about maybe 40 to 50 players sometimes. Yeah. And these guys can go anywhere else and play, but yeah. they want to earn their right to play there. Not right. just that. They understand, obviously, that there's a partnership through there and us that can help them go to the next level. So they're showing up, trying to fight for a spot to get to the next level. That 
just that opportunity alone has not existed in this area before. You know what I mean? So it's, it's something that's special that some people are taking advantage of. And just this past year, I think we've signed at least five players from that organization. Wow. Five. Okay. So. So today we have also Jay, who is the founder and part owner of, of the Bobcats. And I'm going to allow him to tell his perspective uh, from the Bobcats organization. And uh, basically, once again, uh, Jay, where are you from? From Nigeria, <laughs> originally. So I moved down here. I mean, I was going back and forth, but I officially moved down here full time in 2005. 2005. Oh, wow. So you've been around it, enough to see the, the, the soccer space. In oh, the yeah. USA. yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. So, so what was some things that you could think about, you know, that, that stuck out to you that maybe needs to change or what? what do you have anything that sticks out? Lack of opportunity. Mm. Uh, because we got ballers, man, growing up for me, but the opportunity just wasn't there. But, mm. uh, and it's basically who you know, pretty much, for you to be able to even have a chance for tryouts. Some of that small tryout and things like that, it was definitely difficult. So I know a lot of people that would have made it. I bet being a club like the Bobcat for them to showcase their talent back then, that I think we even be somewhere bigger now, uh, pretty much. Lack of opportunities around the area, is that, is that how... What I want to ask is, how did you end up in Bobcats? Because I'm sure the lack of opportunity is something that you saw and you wanted to change in the, in the community. So how did you end up at the Bobcats as, as part uh, owner and a founder? Yeah, I mean, we created a club that, uh, you know, I've, I've told this story several times. I went to UMBC. Okay. And a group of us used to play soccer, like club soccer down there and things like that. Then after we graduated, we wanted to continue to play as a group. So we registered and joined uh, Maryland Majors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Soccer league, and which was a very good amateur soccer league then. So it was a good time for us to still catch up on Sundays because once you get a job, you really don't have time for one another and things like that. So every Sunday we go, we play and things like that. And after we play, we just use that time to also catch up and things like that, uh, pretty much. So that's how we started. And then as everything went on, we, we wanted to create uh, a, a, an organization that can provide opportunity for everyone regardless of where you come from, what your social background is, uh, because we started noticing like lack of opportunities, kind of. And uh, not only that, we started also noticing that the people that also give a lot for most of these amateur clubs were not being recognized well enough. And a couple of them happens to be people that I looked at more like as younger brothers. And for us, it was an eye opener, you know, when we also got to a certain point where we have financial help and things like that, we decided, you know, we're going to now give back and do something whereby if you perform really well, you deserve to be seen. Uh, but that's not always the case. Was it easy to find sponsorships and stuff and for financial help for, for the organization? No. Mm, so how, how were you guys able to, to kind of at least convince some people? So I always tell people, right, you have to be, you have to, do you want to leave yourself a legacy or do you want to just be someone who is not remembered at all? And for what we've created is a vehicle that someone has to start. You have to make that sacrifices. So we don't really have, again, unfortunately, where you play matters if you want sponsorship dollars. <laughs> it, it matters. If anyone tells you it doesn't, it's a lie. The credibility of the league you play in matters. Uh, the league you play in matters uh, because you can't walk through the door We've approached several people and more can testify and the staff can testify to that. Where they would ask you where you play and you tell them the name of the league and they just tell you no. A lot of these sponsors also do their research and they see things as well out there. Uh, so that affects, uh, the, you, we've created a culture as a brand and people know us for a club that is very ethical and they taught, we, we, we go with methods before we implement and we do anything. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes that's not enough, right? Because if you're playing something else, then the repetition is a lot better. So that can also help you push along. But again, it's we've been blessed to have few people who have sacrificed a lot, especially myself and a few of my friends, who have come together and believe in something uh, that is bigger and greater than them. And they're willing to sacrifice a lot. It's not about me being happy. Right. Uh, yes, I've deprived my kids of a lot of good life that they could have had in the last couple of years. But 
if I didn't take that sacrifice, then we wouldn't have a Mo. If I didn't take that sacrifice, we wouldn't have an Alex. If I didn't take that sacrifice, we wouldn't have an Anthony. Are we always going to continue to be self-centered and selfish and think about just us? And so with you trying to build a sacrifice and all that, and or or sacrificing and all that, and building a, a, a team of people around you and a great organization with all due respect to, to Bobcast and what you guys are achieving so far, you guys, like I, like I was saying to Mo, you guys are pulling in a community from different angles. Um, so what was the reason why you guys wanted to try and find a bridge sports or find a whoever else, UPSL, or what was the... the... So we've all started to look for clubs within the community that believe in what we're trying to do. And a lot of clubs see us more as competition, whereas we're mm -hmm. trying to tell them we're more of a vehicle for you. We're a story that we want you to also believe in and also dream and aspire to accomplish whatever it is you want to accomplish, right? This is a club that played just one year in UPSL and one year nationally, right? This is a club that same year, they made it to the UPSL quarterfinals and lost to the eventual champions in Florida Tropics. I've told the story as well. But it's very difficult for people. Again, you can be self-centered. You can have a brand, but at the same time, don't look at us as a competition. Right. Look at us more as an opportunity where we can work together and make our community continue to be better right bridge sport is a completely like it's an organization that believes in us right and i see the work coach sam has done in the community like for players to go and play for bridge sport without collecting a cent from him tells you the kind of person he is because now a lot of clubs think more about financially they give the players this money that money to come and play for them but for you to create such a structure, a very good organization like that, without paying a dime to players, tells me the kind of person you are and your character. He cares more about the community. He cares about the players. He doesn't see them as just, hey, come and play for me and go, which is what we do. We don't want to just take you for 10 months and then wipe our hands clean after right. 10 months and go. No. What is your aspiration after you're done playing, right? We've helped players get their green card. We've helped oh, players wow. get their UFOB licenses. Wow. We're, like, we care more than just come and play for 10 months and you go. There's some players that might not want that kind of relationship, but the door is always right. open. And we're family too. We've had players that have left us, gone to USA and come back to play for us, right? We've had players left. Jake Dangler, Nico Brown, all those players came from us, right? They got the opportunity one year and then boom, they're playing well now, doing well. Khalid Balogun with the Miami FC. So for us, yeah. Bridge Sport is just that perfect story. That's something we haven't seen in our community that we've been looking for, right? right? So they don't see us as competition. They see us more as family. Right. And we're all trying to make our community a better place. All right. So Bridge Sport is not something I've seen within the community. So that makes me now want to go down the whole U.S. soccer because I talked with Mo about the the whole academy situation where it's not MLS next, it's not ECNL. You guys are doing something that's outside of what what US soccer might would say they want. Yeah. And um for me, because when you go to Europe and you see everyone has a, a federation that there's there's a system from from youth to top, no matter which club it is, you guys are doing something completely different. And and my thing is, is this something that that you feel is the country needs more of? Or how do you feel towards it? Because you guys are going outside of maybe the structure of U.S. soccer right now. Yeah. A lot of people try to sell falsehood to, to parents, falsehood to players. We're not that type of clubs. We have a coach who has been through the entire system. For example, he came from France, right? Uh, he played for, I think, Paris FC. He, he understands what the culture is. And that's why our system is, hey, you have the coaches that play on the field, right? Those coaches are coaching the U team. So the U team can come and support their coach. They can see exactly what their coach wants them to do. So, yeah. like you said, this is how soccer is run in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> to be quite honest, we, I mean, giving opportunity to players, whether you have two different paths. Do you want to go to college or do you want to go pro, right? And as a matter of fact, you're boosting their resume like what we did this summer by playing those 17, 16-year-old kids in the Independence Cup. That's giving them... Uh, uh, kind of like an exposure that they need, right? And then when you have some clubs locally who might hear they're playing against the second team, U23, and they just come in so aggressively to play against them, and then they beat them like a couple yeah. of goals, 
we're thinking about the future. We're not thinking about now. We're not telling those players, you need you to win now. No, we want you to grow. You need to learn from this type of experiences. So the aspiration is so much bigger and different, but we're just implementing how soccer should have been implemented from the get-go. So it's nothing, you know what I'm saying, different. If you grew up in Africa, if you grew up in Europe, this is how the soccer system works. It's not necessarily about how much money someone can pay. It's not about your father knows someone that knows someone that knows someone. No, if you can ball, you would play on the field. That's all that matters. So we're just doing what the system is supposed to be like from the get-go. Okay. So first off, going into everything that you've been saying and Jay's been saying, there's some people that might not consider Nisa a professional league. Mm-hmm. Now, what do you know what constitutes a professional league? What what goes into it? What into it? Well, yeah, obviously, if you look at the soccer pyramid in the United States, right? Some people can say they don't consider it, but it is proven as to be a soccer league because a professional soccer league. Because if you look at the pyramid, there's three divisions, right? There's Division One, which is MLS, Division Two, which is USL Championship, and then Division Three has different leagues in that, right? There's NISA, which is the one that we're in. There's USL League One. And then there's MLS Next Pro. Everything else be- below that is amateur, obviously. Um, now, with that Division Three, those three leagues are three different leagues because NISA is an independent league. Independent, right? In a sense where, okay, this is a league where it's sanctioned to be a professional league. However, you know, we're building the whole independent story here, like teams that come from nothing and kind of make it here. And that's their ideology of a league, which is, you know... Do I think they could have been done a little bit differently to be better? I think so, but these are just my opinions. You know, they don't mean anything to anyone but me. So, but why are you guys in around the same level as USL one and not USL two or USL championship or whatever? Not MLS. What? What? Who that is? that is the federation. I think the US Soccer Federation, I believe, is, is one responsible for the sanctioning and the separation of those things. I'm not too sure, to be honest. So, are you guys in a? Are you guys in a? Because, look, even at the youth level, <laughs> some kids over in ECNL might be ranked number one in the country. And then in MLS Next ranked number one in the country. Somebody really has to be a number one. They can't. Everyone can't be number one. Right. I mean, there has to be something in the youth level where people are playing and meshing. Because even in, in England, for example, you have youth FA Cup. Mm-hmm. There's something that you can truly say, okay, we're the top. Mm-hmm. Is there something like this in the USA for, for the professionals? Would it be Open Cup? It would be Open Cup. But that, I think Open Cup is still different because Open Cup leaves the door open for everyone, which is exactly what we're talking about, right? But just to go back to what you're saying, there's number one here and number one here. How do we know who's the true number one, right? right. I think that obviously these are things that is above me, obviously. Um, but if I had any ideas or any input on it, I think that they should start by implementing different rules when it comes to soccer in this country and just kind of like copying the European model. Right. I, if it was if it was up to me, yeah. that's what it would be. Like and and to go I'll even take it a step further to say that the academies in Europe they're free. Right. So which means if that's the that's not the idea here, number one thing you're depriving of yourself is a very good player who doesn't have money. Right. I mean. So so my what are we talking about? So when I when I so backing it up a little when I was talking about number one, number one, I wanted to ask more so like, is there a way Nisa can prove that they're better than US the uh, USL championship or better than USL one or USL one can say, look, this is where we I, I would like to see a uh something where people are actually proving themselves, you know, like this is our level. Cause a kid, I know plenty of college players that go to a, a Bobcats game and might be like, this doesn't, this seems like, I feel like there's D1 players better than this. They feel like. But yeah, until they get out there. Until yeah. That's another thing too. When kids go to Europe all the time, I was sending a kid to Europe, they thought Division 4, Division 2, whatever, yeah. and then they get in there, it's, oh, it's a little bit faster than they thought. Yeah, um, everything looks good when you're watching. When you're watching. When you're in it. Right? So, so, so I guess Open Cup would have been one of those things, but there's not really any true way to decipher between leagues. I, I'm, I'm guessing. Or... Yeah, but I think that these are questions for Nisa, right? Yeah. Nisa should, 
if they if they're looking into what you're saying right and they want to make that a better way that would be up to them to decide it wouldn't be up to me do i have ideas on how i think should things should go yeah but they will have to pay me for me to share that with them so <laughs> okay so what about yeah. what about the college players so college players are coming in do you guys look at the college players during their seasons are you guys going to scout or you just only scout so I, for you to say that i will shine some light on our sporting director his name is anthony ugorji this guy is like, I mean, he does those kinds of things. Like, there are times where I call him to ask him certain things. This guy's telling me I'm watching college games. And I'm like, like, he's looking into that kind of stuff. And during off season, he's kind of like reaching out to some players that he's keeping tabs on, right? Wow, okay. Because for example, I'll give you a quick example of this past season. Before we jumped into this season, he spearheaded a whole project where he kind of like built a, a structure of how we go about recruiting, right? And obviously myself and Alex, we we are involved in the process, but he kind of took lead on that, right? All right, these are the type of things we're looking for. This is what we're going to do. For example, our combine, it wasn't just like a show up and play 11 v 11. We had three days of the combine, right? The first day you're testing speed, agility, all kinds of movement, and we're recording your numbers for you, which is data, right? right. The second day you come in, um, you're doing some other kind of tests, and then the third day you, you're playing, right? So... At the end of the day, whether you make it or not, one thing you leave that's combined with is data. You know how fast you run a 40, you know how you you need data to be able to, you know, to be able to move around in this in this or in this world. So those are things that, you know, are important to us. But just to go back to what you were saying, as far as like how much scouting is being done, yeah, that is something that, you know, we have someone for that department that takes care of those things and he does a very good job at it. So So you guys have the trial the, the trial aspect of the three days and data is being given and all this stuff and you guys are also scouting and, and and stuff like this i'm a person i'm a big believer in like you can't get much in three days true um, and and are you guys the type of club or an organization that will bring players in like call a player bring them in for like a week of course we've done that all season so we do a combine with three days and that three days is more than a lot of people are doing right, right. and i mean that because i mean some places do trials and you come in do possession and then you jump into 11 v 11 and then you may or may not get a call right? right so we understand that you may not give us your best on one day right. you got another day to come back you may not give us your best on that day then there's a third day for it now obviously we can keep going but we don't have that kind of time if we're just being realistic right so you know we'll do that and then the ones that ex so I'll, I'll give you a rundown of what happened this season once we did that right we picked maybe three or four players from that combine right but there were other players that showed some promise there. Right. But obviously we realized that, you know, with the squad that we're building and the squad that we have, these players might come in here and not see the field or they're not prepared or they're not ready yet. The partnership with Bridgeport was key because we were able to send some of those players there to be ready. Uh, okay. So we're like, okay, you have some potential. You might need some, some tuning, right? You might need a, a couple of things here. This is our partner club. Go there because we are keeping contact with this club to know your evolution, right? What to know when you're ready or not. And me myself, I'm going to these training sessions. I'm coaching some of them sometimes, and I'm I'm involved. So you're like, fully involved. I'm fully year. involved in in everything that is when it comes to just building the community and the team the right way, right. obviously, because that is the role that was given to me. So right. I obviously take it seriously. So so we sent some players there. Throughout the season, they've been performing very well. This And by the way, earlier in the interview, I mentioned to you that towards the end of the season, we signed five players. We gave three to our youth and two to players from there. Right. One of them is one from the combine Wow! that we sent there, and he's performed extremely well throughout the entire season, and we rewarded him with an amateur contract towards the end of the season just to have him train with the team consistently. That's some good incentive to everyone around as well, yeah. I mean, that we, we can't just say things without doing them, right. in my opinion. we If we're telling you this is what we're doing, we have to do it. But we also have to see a good enough product to do right. that. We can't just, can't be smoking mirrors. We can't just tell you, you know, we're using, this is a partnership club. You know, the players who are in the community that are ready to go to the next level, they're obviously going to perform here and then they'll get a chance. That doesn't mean we'll sign them. They get a chance to come and prove themselves with our first team. And if they can make it, we'll sign them. If they can't make it, they go back down and it's on to the next one. But the whole point is offering that in, its, in itself. That's a big deal. You know what I mean? So... That's one thing that we've done this season. And again, to go back to that player, you know, he was able to be signed, um, finished out the season with us training. Now our season's over. So obviously moving forward, now we get to reevaluate. What did we see while he was training with us? Is he ready? Does he need to go back down? Whatever the case may be. But this is just one part of the recruiting process. Obviously, we have proven players in the league. That's a whole different process because 
before the season started, we had a bunch of players who have played pro before reach out to us. We can't call those players to a combine that we set up where everyone just sign up and play. We hosted a different tryout called Invite Only. Right. And then we co compiled all these players that reached out to us, sent them the dates, sent them the times to be there. They show up. We watch them train. We watch them go at it. And then we pick from there as well. And this is aside from the retention list, re meaning the guy that we kept, the guys that we kept from the season before. Okay. So, so moving on from that aspect now, now, now let's, let's talk about the season. Um, there's a lot of things to uncover about it. Man, man. But, but one thing I need to first ask is there's like eight teams. Nine. Nine. Five on the West and four in the East. Yeah. What, what I have to ask is, is there a lot of traveling involved? Planes and like, how? Okay. Yeah, so I mean, for us, so so they try to do it regionally this year. Last year, we were flying all over the place. Like, we'll go to California for a game, come back, go to Michigan for a game, come back. But this season, they try to do it divisions, right? So there's the East and then there's the West, obviously. Um, and there were supposedly be supposed to be a, a, a mid-season tournament where all of the teams on the East fly to a location, all the teams on the West fly to a location, and we play each other. But obviously, that did not happen. Um, for whatever reasons, I think you should interview someone in East and ask them. I'm not going to give you those answers. Okay. But, um, you know, those things didn't happen. They were supposed to. So we just kind of kept it East and West. And then the playoffs were supposed to be winner of the East versus winner of the West, like a semifinal final. So top two East, top two West play a semifinal. And then the final is being played by the team that won both. And then that's how you win the national championship. Okay. So that was the model this season. But. Okay. So your first season, which was last year. Yes. How How do you recall that going? You. it was it for us we felt we ended the season feeling like we could have done so much more even though it was our first year right so that i mean that that shows the standard that we have as a staff obviously and then the type of caliber players that we have we have some very good players on our team which i'll touch on um in a minute as well but we kind of went into that season we made the playoffs we won the most games in the club history um broke a couple of other pretty small records like but these are these things were big deals to us like, it doesn't have to mean anything to anyone else mm -hmm. but to us and the work that we put in it meant something to us and i'm not ashamed to, to admit that right so so we we kind of worked on those things and then we made the playoffs to quarterfinals um against albion sent i think the albion team yeah it was a west coast team um played 120 minutes got a red card in that game went into penalty kicks and then we lost on the last kick from our goalkeeper, right? Who played, who had a tremendous season too, by the way. He, he had a very good season. This is the same one that went to MLS next after that season. Um, you know, unfortunately, he missed the last kick, but that doesn't define him or who he is as a person. So, um, so yeah, we lost in the quarterfinals, and then we were pretty bummed about it, right? And, you know, we we're like, all right, we'll see what we can do next year. And we kind of left the season there. Everyone felt like we could have done more, but I think that was a big win for me. Your first, your first, first year, as, as an assistant, assistant coach. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And obviously that year, did you, were you a GM the whole year? No, or? I was just an assistant coach, simply okay. assistant coach, which is the year where I was telling you that, you know, I would talk to Alex because we got really close and Alex was like the face of the organization because he's the head coach. He's the president of the youth. He has a lot on his plate. He yeah. does a lot. Right. And, um, you know, when we got close, you know, we started talking and I'm starting to just give input on things and he's like hey i think you can help us in in other directions anthony as well very smart guy gives his input on certain things and alex is like hey i think you guys can do more than just this so alex brought the conversation to jay and we kind of you know talked about it and after that it was like okay well this is what you can do so go out there and do it let's see it prove yourself okay you know so we which you did so we 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 got to work man we we like i say a lot of things it looks a certain way to the public but behind 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 closed doors there's a lot of work that that's been put in a lot of hours a lot of you know a lot of things has been done behind the scenes so so going into the second season now which is this year um what type of work cuz you guys went on an incredible run this year what type of work did you guys put in to to get to the end season that you did so it started first with the recruitment like we had to first when the season ended and we realized okay we're going to take on all these roles we had multiple meetings right between the three of us and said hey okay if we want to do something special next year we have to bring in the right characters first of all that's the first and foremost the main important thing to all of us right is who you are as a person forget how good you are there's a lot of players that are really good but you know there are things that are questionable that they can ruin a bigger picture right. by just being that good so 
we had very good players on the team, but then we decided, hey, let's go, let's go at certain characters or certain individuals. And before we even bring you in for a trial or anything, we actually interview you. Like we set up interview processes, we kind of do our own research about you, and we ask you certain questions. And depending on how you answer, we know what kind of person you are. Because right. you have all three of us judging you and just kind of listening to you talk. And after that, we're kind of exchanging our thoughts and what we think is a good fit for what we're trying to do and what we're not trying to do. Because what we're trying to do this season was to build a culture. And I think we did a pretty good job at that. We had a very good culture this season where people, you know, they know you have to show up and you have to put in the work, especially if you want to play. So. Part of the culture, I'm assuming, it, and the professional environment in general is just showing up to training every day. These guys also do does, do they all have jobs on the side? Half yeah, time and... yeah. These guys have a lot of things going on on the side, but they show up. Mm. They show up. Wow. They show up, and and they could be doing a lot more other things as well. But you know, again, there there's a lot of things that that kind of happen that you know you just like we have something special here because. And the reason why I say that is I can look at other teams and see some things that they're struggling with. Right. Like when they have to travel and they don't have their best team out there with them because they those players decided to do something else. Right. I'm not going to dive too much into that. But right. every time we had to go somewhere, our guys were there. Our guys were there. Okay. Our guys showed up for everything. When we do these community events, right, because one of the partnerships that we established this season was with a financial literacy company. So we offered financial literacy classes to all of our players. They're showing up there. You know, like we have like partnership with uh, Saints Row, who's a beer company. Right. And they, you know, they have a bar and things like that. We did an event there. All the players show up. And those guys are great, by the way. They support us so much, man. They're 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 a very good, good group of guys, you know. So. So going through the whole season now, we're getting towards the end. And you guys, had, like I said, had an incredible run. And um, you have the trophy here yeah. to, to, to show for it. Congrats. Yeah. Thank you. Um. So talk me through what happened in the end of the season, why you guys weren't able to participate in, in playoffs. You know what? That is a great question for Nisa. Mm. That is a great question for Nisa because I don't want to sit here and attack anyone, right? However, I do have questions, just like you have questions, right? Because, okay, we're now a team that, you know, don't want to give too much information, but, you know, we joined the league beginning of the season. We went, Alex and I went to a meeting in California. We were there for couple of days right met with the league officials you know all right season starting this is what we're going to do this is what we're going to do okay cool season starts some internal things are going on that i can't speak on at the moment right however we can revisit at a later date okay. um you know season starts we're playing we're playing very well we're beating everybody literally we won 18 games undefeated in the season um we're eligible to play because we've played 18 games. We're the only team in the league that played every single game. A lot of teams. What does that mean? So there are a lot of forfeits that happened this season in NISA. Because of lack of numbers? or Lack of whatever. I don't know. That's not my business. <laughs> right? And I mean, I don't want to speak on it. Yeah, yeah, However, yeah. it's like, whatever for whatever reason, the game didn't happen. One team has three points. Another game showed up. It didn't happen. One team has three points. Some internal things going on. Okay, fair enough. But when it came to us, we've never missed a game. We played every single game. We're the only team that did that, right? Wow. All, all up until our 19th game, which is the last game of the season. And the team we were supposed to play, by that time, the season's decided. I mean, we've earned 47 points in the field of play. Right. That's huge, yeah. right? Um, by that time, the season's decided. The team we're supposed to play on our last game at home, whether they show up or not, it doesn't matter. The season's yeah. decided, so they decide not to show up. So the league gives us three points as a forfeit, right? Not that we needed it, but, you know, the season was decided by then. So then, come towns for the playoffs. And then we learn at the same time as everyone else that we're ineligible to compete in the playoffs. But throughout the season, is there any, because you also talked about meetings and stuff. Yeah. Throughout the season, is there any, anything that would have given you guys an inkling that we're going through some problems with the league or with the head guys or so we've had some meetings with the league throughout the throughout the season right and they had their stance and we had our stance about things that make sense to the both of us okay. while we're having these meetings okay they have their stance and we have ours and then um at the end of the season we find out that you know we didn't 
they say we're ineligible because we didn't meet the requirements uh, for NISA and for U.S. Soccer Federation. I have yet to hear from U.S. Soccer Federation, but I've heard from NISA that we're not able to play. Mm. So, have you guys tried to reach out to U.S. Soccer Federation? Um, those there are things that are in the works at mm. the moment. So um, we're still we're still waiting. For so them. we're just we're just kind of just. But right now, what I really mm. want to focus on is kind of pushing for the league to come out and explain how we were able to be eligible throughout the season. season. But when it came time for us to, in my opinion, go out there and win it all, mm. we're not we're not eligible anymore. I mean, what is it? So do you think that... Like, is are there things that you just found out that makes us ineligible? Or are there things that you've known... The whole time. The whole time. That's making us ineligible at this point. Which one is it? Which is so, how does that affect the whole organization, you guys individually as a team? Like, how do you guys feel towards it? I mean, it's a bummer. Me personally, I feel for the players, man. Like I said, I was there yeah. for the majority of the part. Every trip, every training, for the most part, I was there. I've seen how hard these guys worked, right? Mm. So, there are certain fights that are not meant for the players to fight. And those right. are the fights that we will fight for them. And by we, I'm talking about myself, Alex, Anthony, and Jay, right? We're going to go out there and fight for you guys. Just fight on the field for us. We got the rest, right? right? But at the end of the day, when you see something like that happen and you're like, man, that's not fair to these guys. These guys right. put in so much work, man. They wanted, they wanted to prove to the world that they're the best team in this league. Right. And I think they've proven that. Right. How did how do you keep the best team in your league away from the playoffs? Yeah. When it comes to playoff anything, any sport, in my opinion, it's the best playing against the best. Right? Mm. That's that's my opinion yeah. of if you put it that way, and then the best is not in there. So I mean, what are we talking about here? <laughs> is no it is the playoffs play. even valid at yeah. this point? I mean, they have a game going on, I think, this weekend or next. I'm not watching that. Yeah, yeah. Because the the best team's not there. I mean <laughs> the best team. That's 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 my opinion, but you know, it is what it is. So okay so in terms of now like going forward do you think there's even a possibility that because let's say for example they they come out with the why or they don't come out with anything mm -hmm. do you think there's even a chance that things can be replayed in terms of playoffs because that you know if you know what i'm trying to say i mean i don't honestly that's a question that i don't have the answer to but i know one thing is the guys that were in that locker room this season they want nothing but to play. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if things pass, I mean, by then they'll probably get over it and whatever the case may be. It's unfair, unjust, or whatever the case may be. But I know one thing. If we call our guys today and say, hey, something was reversed, we got to go out there and play, everyone is lacing up. That's for sure. So what does this trophy exactly mean, then? It just means that... The regular season. We are the best team in the league. So every league has a regular season. You win that at the end of the season, then it's playoffs to win something totally different, right? This trophy right here that you see behind you is a testament to the hard work of all of these players and the points that they've earned on the field more than any other team in that league. Mm -hmm. All of the obligations that they were supposed to fulfill on that field, they've done that. Played 19, 18 games. One was a forfeit. Everyone else played 17, 18, whatever the case may be. When it comes to just a regular season, the champion on both conferences, East or West, with the best record, most goals scored. Like, I can go on and on about things that we've accomplished this season, and these players have something to celebrate. Right. So imagine if this trophy didn't exist. Right. Then what would these players feel like? I wasted my time mm -hmm. for 10 months. Right. Not to say that this is some type of consolation, right. but it's like, okay, you guys, if no one's going to recognize you, we are. Okay. So now... As far as Bobcats goes, in any of these meetings with NISA or U.S. Soccer, whatever the case may be, have has there ever come up a conversation of, okay, what's the next step in terms of U.S. Uh, USL championship at MLS? Like, is, is, are those conversations you have? So with that, it's funny because I'm hearing so many different things that it's like, the one thing I want to say when it comes to that is the public, we have a very strong community fan base that feel like they know where we belong right and and that's and that's a, that's a testament to them based on what they see and, and how they see things are being ran so they go out there and you know i saw something i was reading something online the other day and i saw someone post something saying oh i got from a credible source that 
Maryland Bobcats is speaking with USL and, and this, that, and a third, but that has not come from us, right? <laughs> right? But again, people have their ideas and what they think. They look at it, they're like, okay, you know, I think this team belongs in USL. I think this team belongs in this, that. I have one of my friends, I'm not going to say their name, call me and say, yo, are you guys actually going to join MLS? I heard you guys are going to be the MLS franchise of Maryland. I'm like, where are you getting this information <laughs> from? But, you know, like I hear all kinds of crazy things, especially after the news broke out. Right. Obviously, because I know a lot of people in the community, they all reach out with questions and things like that. And I can't answer everyone at once because some things I can't really speak on. Um, but it's like, yeah, I'm hearing all kinds of things. But as far as us, we have not publicly came out and said we're doing anything. We're going anywhere. or we. But obviously, when that time comes, if it is going to come, we'll be the first ones to let it out. But for now, a lot of people are hearing different things and just assuming that, Oh, Bobcats is doing this. Bobcats is doing that, but they don't really know. It. You know, it's all speculations. So. Do, you, do you have an idea of where you see the the club going? I mean, something's in there. You know, it's, that's in the works. Th these are things that you have to kind of discuss yeah. with everyone first, right? And then you have to be prepared. That's the biggest thing for me, right? It's like, okay, we want to go here, we want to go there, we want to go there, we want to stay here, but are we prepared to do what whatever it is that we need to do? So let's figure that part out first before we start throwing anything out there. Because I don't like doing things without knowing exactly or having a GPS or knowing exactly where I'm trying to go. Because it becomes smoking mirrors, which is one thing that I try to avoid. Try to avoid yeah. And the one thing that this organization tries to avoid. We don't just sell you dreams. We tell you something, we're going to do it. Jay spoke on this earlier, but he didn't really touch on it enough that when you join this organization and you come in to Maryland Bobcast, whether you're a player, a coach, or whatever, we're not just trying to get you to, to do a service to us. We're... These interview processes that we're talking about, when we do it with these players, we ask them, what did you study in school, right? What are you trying to do when you're done? We have a player right now. His name is Abdul. He's on our team. Um, he's a player. He wears the number six, right? He's into marketing and things like that. So he was a player on the season, but he was helping on the marketing side. So he has that experience. When it, he wakes up tomorrow and he doesn't want to play anymore, he has experience working with a pro team on the marketing side. That's something he can bring to any table he goes to. That's just one example, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? We have coaches that come in and say, you know, sometimes people just want a quick money. Like, oh, I want to coach kids, right? But if you want to take it serious, there's a pathway to education with U.S. Soccer Federation. Right. You can take your courses and get your badges so that you can, you become unturnable. No one's going to be like, yeah, I don't want you. You have your licenses. You've done the work. We support you and pay for those classes for you. So, so with what you and Jay said, um, Are you guys still signing people under one-year contracts? Because I know a lot of USL and NISA clubs with one-year contract, maybe a, a year extension if possible, but are you guys still going that route? So, yeah. So so when it comes to NISA, um, a lot of the contracts are definitely one year, right? But we have a couple of players on our team right now that are on multi-year deals. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Because, that, that's unheard of for sure. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes you got to do certain things the right way. That, right, of course. You know, some players, you want to, if, if it's a good marriage, why not? If if the meaning if the player is happy here yeah. and you're happy with the player, hey, why do I have to just lock you down for one year? Maybe you want a multi year. Let's let's figure out. Let's work out the numbers, right? Okay. Um, or you know, you never know. Sometimes you see a promising young talent and you're like, hey, instead of locking you down for one year, maybe I'll give you two to three years, right? And if you do well, maybe I can loan you somewhere to do something and get more experience and even become better. And after that, we either sell you or you come back. Yeah. However it works, it's just, it's, that's just the business. So, Okay. So as far as Mo. Yeah. Because you didn't, if, I remember a conversation where we first started talking a certain way and you didn't even, you didn't even know how you pretty much ended up in this position. Right. 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 That's right? a fact. So now, you know, things have been moving a certain way for you. Mm -hmm. and, and congrats to you for everything, by the way. Thank you. Um, Things are opening up in different ways. Do you still have a, not really have an idea how how your life is working in terms of that, or do you have a, a goal? Like, what what is Mo five years from now? Um, five years from now, that's a tough question for me because right now there's so much going on mm -hmm. that I'm focused on next year before <laughs> thinking five right. years from now. Okay, but I'll give you an answer, an honest answer, right? Um, based on the way things have been going for the last. I would say 18, 19 months, right? From the first time that I came in as an assistant coach to actually getting onto the management side and seeing how things work, I do have a clear cut idea on what it is that I want to do when it comes to this sport. Um, I've obviously gained some experience um, 
And I was able to navigate through some situations as if I knew what I was doing, but it's more so like, you know, it's a lot of these things are just, you know, intuition and, um, and obviously all credit goes to God, right? That's the first thing, first and foremost for me personally. But I think that five years from now, um, I would definitely want to stay in an executive position when it comes to the sport, for sure. Okay. Because I, I, I've, I've seen all different levels of the sport, right? right? From the youth to amateur to pro to recreational to just knowing how to deal with talent and people and just kind of using my own intuitions to kind of making that thing possible. So, okay. yeah. so as you come to a close, um, is there anything you want to say towards the fans and the people supporting um, Bobcats along the way? Anyone? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to everyone that's a fan of the Maryland Bobcats in the community, um, our journey is far from over. That's the first and foremost thing I would like to say, right? Obviously, um, the season ended just as far as that. That's, it's not the end, right? Because obviously, we're working tirelessly to make sure that um, we get the proper recognition that we deserve. We're working tirelessly to make sure that the people that's worked very hard that work doesn't just, you know, become useless, right? So just stay tuned. There are a lot of exciting things that will come out to the public. Um, unfortunately, I can't share too much. However, we're working. We're working on a lot of things for sure. So, yeah, is there anyone specific you want to shout out? Um, I mean, just the people that are very close to me, you know, like, because uh, it's been a journey for me. And obviously, I couldn't do everything that I'm doing by myself. I'm, I have a couple of mentors, you know, I have people that... Um, you know, have been in my life as far as just helping me with these things. Like parents, like my parents, I really mean my mother, right? She's been there always guiding me with a lot of stuff, not with the, the, the just in general, right? And then, um, you know, I have my close friends, people that I play, people that we played with together when we were younger, they're still around. They support the vision. They support what I have going on. They support that I do, uh, things that I do. And, you know, just a few mentors that actually help me out with the coaching part like I have one guy his name is Sona coach Sona he's a very known coach in the area okay. um he coached a lot of the guys that I'm coaching now oh, wow. when they were kids right but this is a person that has done a lot for me as far as just helping me um just you know moving on to the next step of my career he helped me out a lot and I learned a lot from him so that is definitely another person that I want to um shout out but then other than that just my close friends people that I grew up with and you know just people in my circle really so yeah all right, well, you guys had it, the special with Mo here and Jay. Yeah. Um, if you guys are new to the channel, once again, if you stayed around this long, I just want to say thank you so much to, to you guys for watching. Thanks for Mo and Jay sure. for coming out to uh, support me and share their their story as well. So uh, you're back here at Round FC, and uh, until next time, stay tuned for some more. Thanks for having me. Thank you.